For those of you that have already joined, we're just giving people a few more moments to get on and then we'll get started. Hello all and welcome to the Ohio Chambers monthly webinar series. This month's webinar is focused on addressing workplace harassment in the post Me Too and COVID-19 environments. For employers, creating a workplace that is inclusive and welcoming to all is a top priority because employees are more productive when they feel safe and can be their genuine self while at work. Presenting on today's webinar um, is Joe DeAndre and Sarah Sams from the law firm Squire Patton Boggs. Squire Patton is an international law firm with 50 locations across the United States, Europe, and the Middle East. They have practice areas ranging from labor and employment to real estate. Sarah is an associate in Squire's labor and employment practice and is a graduate from Ohio State University Law School, where she served as editor-in-chief for the Ohio State University's Journal on Dispute Resolution and was a member of the National Order of Barristers. During law school, she also served as a clerk for Judge Marbley in the U.S. District Court here in Southern, in the, for Southern Ohio. The other presenter, Joe DeAndre, is a senior associate in the uh, Squires Labor and Employment Practice as well, where he advises and defends employers in all aspects of employment disputes arising under a myriad of state and federal laws impacting the employer-employee relationship. He's also testified in, at the Ohio State House in support of legislation impacting Ohio's business community. Prior to joining Squire, Joe served as an assistant attorney general for the state of Ohio. He has received accolades for his successful track record of defending clients, including being named as a lawyer to watch for labor and employment litigation by the best lawyers in America. And he was also named a rising star by Ohio Supreme Lawyers. Before I turn it over to Joe and Sarah, I want to uh, let everyone know that today's webinar has been approved by the Ohio Supreme Court for one hour of CLE credit and is approved for SHRM credit, uh, continuing as education credits too. And now, Joe and Sarah, the show is yours. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so everybody, thank you for being on today and joining us. Um, and Kevin, thanks for all the nice things you said about us. Uh, I probably don't deserve a lot of them. Uh, but anyway, uh, just jumping into this, you know, what we're here to talk about today um, is the impact of Me Too. What real, we all know what, what you know, how that started, um, but what really, what impact does that have on employers uh, in Ohio? Uh, and then we're also going to talk about some other states as well and, and, and what's happened and, and what's happened across the country. So that's kind of our focus today is focusing on what happened with um, what happened with me too, and how does that impact employers? Um, so, uh, as as Kevin mentioned, you know, Sarah and I both work in labor and employment law at Squire Patent Boggs. We represent employers all over the country, and, and what that means is we we are up to date with a lot of things and developments that are taking place in different states, and we also uh, do see a lot of different interesting scenarios. We have a lot of really good stories to tell. If you ever get us by a bonfire. We are the life of the party because we have all the good stories to tell about what we've seen in our experiences. So what we do is we try to make them uh, useful and, and teaching people kind of wh where the pitfalls are and, and where um, the way to go uh, is. So the purpose of this session in my mind is for you guys to be able to ask questions. And I know that we don't have the capabilities in this platform to shout out your questions, but I do know that there is a, ch a chat room and a question and answer function that you guys can utilize. I'll be monitoring those as we go today. So please use that as a way to communicate with us and we will address your questions to the best of our ability as we go. So please do not be uh, shy in using the chat functions. Um, let's see. Uh, so let's, let's kind of jump in. And one thing that I want to do first before we get going is 
let's talk about harassment. Um, we know that that harassment, you know, we, we hear the word a lot. And actually, Sarah, can you go, can you go right back one more? I, I skipped ahead a little bit. Apologies, it's my fault. Um, so here's kind of our roadmap. We're gonna first talk about harassment in the workplace. Next, Sarah's gonna give us a little recap of what Me Too involved uh, and, and what came out of Me Too. Then we're gonna talk about what really is the practical impact of the Me Too movement for employers. Uh, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about Ohio law in particular. Ohio has its own anti-discrimination, anti-harassment statutes. What things have changed there? What do you need to know in that area? And then lastly, you know, putting the law aside, uh, what are some practical tips for employers to avoid scenarios uh, where they're involved in, in allegations of, of sexual harassment? Or if, if there are issues with sexual harassment, what should the employer do to address them? And we're going to get into those practical tips. So first part, and we can move on to the next slide here, is what is harassment? Um, and before we get into sexual harassment, I would just want to make a little comment because I think it's often overlooked is that harassment is broader than sexual harassment. A lot of times when you hear the word sexual harassment, you think, or sorry, you hear the word harassment, you automatically think sexual harassment because that's the most common one that you, you hear about. That's what you hear about in the news and everything. But harassment under the law, under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, under Ohio law, it really is, um, it, 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 it can be, uh, harassment on the basis of any protected characteristic. So that could be sexual harassment, harassment on the basis of sex, but it could be any of the things you see up on the screen right now. It could be race, uh, racial harassment, uh, harassment on the basis of age, harassment on the basis of citizenship, religion, et cetera. All those protected characteristics can serve as a basis of harassment. Now, we're not here to talk about that today, but I want to let you know that that is the basis of the law. Really, any protected characteristic uh, it can serve as the basis uh, for a harassment claim. But getting back to sexual harassment, which is what we are here for today, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about, about what it really is just under the law, just to give us a basic framework uh, to work from. So um, first of all, uh, you know, harassment really is unwelcome conduct. And when we say a welcome, unwelcome from who? A welcome from the eyes of the victim. So when we're looking at the person who's receiving the, the words or the conduct, did that person want that? Were they okay with that? That's kind of the first question. If they weren't okay with it, if they did not want it, that's called unwelcome. That's kind of the first step of deciding whether something constitutes harassment. From there, there's really two factors you need to think about as to whether anything uh, constitutes harassment. Was the, was the conduct offensive to the victim? So in addition to being unwelcome, did it actually offend the person? And what we're talking about there is a subjective standard. We're saying, was the person themselves, the person who's the victim, were they really offended by this? Um, that is one element of this. The next element, and this is the third one you see on the screen, is would it be offensive to the reasonable victim, which is an objective standard? And let me tell you why that matters. The first part is, you know, was the conduct offensive to the victim? Well, sure. I'm sure we all know someone who's very, um, could be more sensitive than the average person. And let's say you walk in in the morning and you say hello. And the person goes, oh my gosh, that was so offensive. I can't believe the person said hello to me this morning. And when you think about that, you think, well, geez, if I can't say hello to someone, what can I do? That's not, that's not offensive. Well, that's what we're talking about with this third factor. Was it offensive to the reasonable person? And so those are kind of the three elements that kind of talk about what baseline uh, harassment is. So did it actually offend the person? And then next, um, was it offensive to the reasonable person? And you might say, well, what would the reasonable person find offensive? Well, I don't know the answer to that. All I know is that's what lawyers fight about all the time. Uh, but that is something that, that uh, you know, certainly we can talk about later if we get it. But I just want to give you a little framework. Um, from there, uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about harassment and, and kind of being broken into two different categories. We have two categories. One is quid pro quo. Um, and the other, now hold on, I got a question here. And I'm just going to see um, vaccine harassment. Um, I want to, let's, let's take a look at this. I'll, I'll come back to this question in a second. But I want to just let you know that someone is asking the audience, is there anything 
um, that is that protects people from vaccine harassment. Now, I don't know of anything right now, but I can get into that a little bit later. Um, but I want to get through this part first. Um, but thank you for the question. I'll address that later on. Um, so types of harassment, we have the two quid pro quo and hostile work environment. Let's go to quid pro quo and talk about that first. Um, quid pro quo, I think this is especially appropriate for talking about the Me Too movement, because this is the type of harassment that really gave rise to the Me Too movement. Um, quid pro quo is a Latin phrase. Um, it means this for that. There's an exchange being set up uh, between the person making the offer and the person who the person making the offer wants something from. Um, and, and an example of that, you know, you can see in Harvey Weinstein, for example, a lot of the people who, who um, alleged harassment from Harvey Weinstein said that he would say, you do this sexual act to me and I will help you attain this next level of your career. Or if you don't do this for me, I will not help you and I will block you from attaining this next level of your career. He's basically putting out something that says, if you do this, I will do that. That's the exchange we're talking about with quid pro quo harassment. Now, I will say that in the workplace environment, this can be a little more subtle, I guess, and it's, it's never really subtle, but it, it could be a little more subtle. And here's an example that I use when I do a har when I do harassment and discrimination training. I say, let's say that you know Dale and Chelsea work together. Dale's a supervisor. Chelsea is uh, a person who reports to Dale. And Dale has a crush on Chelsea. And Dale says, you know what? Um, Chelsea, I think you're great. I would love to take you on a date sometime. And Chelsea says, you know what, Dale? Very flattered by the offer, but no, I'm not interested uh, in going out with you. And Dale, you know, let's just say Dale says, you know what? Thanks for letting me know and leaves her alone. Nothing wrong with that, assuming the dating policy allows for supervisors to date subordinates. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But let's say he says this instead. Let's say he says, you know what, Chelsea? That is too bad that you won't even go out with me for one day because I was just doing your performance review. And you know what? I, I, I was going to give you a five out of five, but now this mentorship opportunity that you just passed up, you know what? I'm, I just don't know if you have the you have what it takes to move up to the next um, level of your career. And it could be something like that, uh, where there's an offer being put out. And if someone doesn't take it, there's some kind of benefit being taken away, uh, you know, from the employee. That's something that's always wrong. It's something that you always report. And frankly, now, in the entertainment industry, I know there's very prevalent allegations of that. But as an employment lawyer working with employers, uh, you know, that a lot of times are manufacturing operations or office settings. You don't see a lot of this. A lot of people know better than to, than to do this type of, of harassment. This is something that people kind of know is wrong and they stay away from it from the standpoint of you know, what we see on a day-to-day -day basis. But we all know that it does happen. We do see it sometimes and it certainly did spark the Me Too movement. So let's go to the next type of harassment. And this type of harassment is the one that really is, is a bigger bucket. It kind of en encapsulates a larger number of claims uh, than, than the quid pro quo kind. So it's called hostile work environment. And basically um, this little definition up here kind of sums it up. It's unwelcome conduct, which we talked about. Um, but in addition to the things that we talked about, this is unwelcome conduct um, that uh, unreasonably interferes with an individual's work performance. Um, so that means that it has an impact on what happens in the workplace um, uh, with you. And that's kind of the standard. Now, when, we when we we're talking about, you know, what is hostile work environment, you know, we, we know it's unwelcome conduct. It could be words. It could be, um, it could be conduct, something that someone does. It could be physical touching. Uh, it could be the way someone looks at you. Um, things like that um, is what we're talking about here. But what really makes it hostile? Well, here's, here's kind of what the law says. And this is federal law, this is Ohio law, and we'll talk a little bit about you know, some other changes that happened as a result of Me Too in other states. But in Ohio and in federal law, what makes a env work environment hostile are based on two factors, and it's kind of a sliding scale. 
the first factor is how severe is the conduct? How severe are we talking about? And the second factor is how often does it happen? So how free, or how severe is it? And how often is it taking place? How frequent is it? Um, and let me give you an example of what I mean. There's some conduct that is so severe that it doesn't need to happen twice for it to be a hostile work environment. Let's, um, let's take this example. Let's say that Frank and Jen are walking down a hallway and Frank just goes up and against Jen's will, grabs her chest, okay? Now, that is a very severe situation. That's sexual assault. Um, that does not need to happen twice for it to be a hostile work environment. But let's go back and reset the stage. Let's say Jen and Frank are walking down that same hallway. And let's say that and, and the previous incident never occurred. So we're starting fresh here. Uh, and let's say that Frank is walking by Jen and his arm accidentally brushes up against Jen's arm. Now, Jen didn't ask for her arm to be brushed up against, but Frank says, you know what? I'm sorry, my mistake. Now, Sarah, tell me what you think here. Do you think that's a hostile work environment? We've got brushing against the arm. It happens one time and Frank says it's an accident. Do we think that's a hostile work environment? Uh, no, Joe, that would not be a hostile work environment. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's, let's change the example a little bit. Let's say that that happened on a Monday and let's say on Thursday, Frank and Jen walking down the same hallway and, you know, Frank accidentally brushes his arm up against Jen's arm again and says, apologies, clumsy arm here, my mistake. Do we think that rises to the level of hostile work environment? No, still like unlikely to be a hostile work environment. But what, what, would, what about if it happens, let's say over a course of five days, let's say it happens twice a day. So 10 times in the course of five days. And, you know, again, Frank is saying, hey, I'm sorry, it's an accident, but it's happening 10 times over the course of five days. Do we think that that could be a hostile work environment? Yeah, 10 times over the course of five days likely would be a hostile work environment. Yeah, and, and the point of this is really to say, look, even something very small, like an accidental brushing of the arm against someone else's arm, even though it's very minor, not very severe, if it happens enough times, it can add up to becoming a hostile work environment. So even small, small things, if it happens enough and shows a pattern, can be a hostile work environment. And you might ask, and people have asked, Joe, you just said two wasn't enough brushes, but 10 was. How many is it till you get the hostile work environment? Is it three? Is it seven? Well, the answer again is, I don't know. Lawyers fight about this stuff. But the point that you want your employees to know, the point that you want to communicate to people you work with is, when you make a report in that scenario, you make a report when you feel uncomfortable. And I think that that goes a long way in making employees feel comfortable that they can come to you and express what they feel in the workplace so that they feel comfortable where they work. And I think that's a valuable piece of information. Uh, it's, it's kind of a tip we'll cover here in the end about the training aspect uh, with regard to employees. Um, another piece I was want to note real quick is, is that a lot of times people think hostile work environment, sexual harassment, you know, if I'm an employer, I've got to worry about what they do when they're on the job at my office working or at the work site working. Certainly you do. That's definitely the case. Um, but the law, is broader than that. The law extends farther than just the physical confines of your, your office space or where the people or your employees are actually working. Um, it extends to lunches you take during the day. It extends to happy hours or dinners that happen after work, even if they're not paid for by work or work related. They're just people that go to a happy hour who work together. Um, that can still be a place where employment laws and sexual harassment liability for an employer can accrue. Um, also, uh, social media, um, employees that work together communicating via social media, things that happen over that platform, that can still serve as a place where sexual harassment can occur. So sexual harassment is not just limited to the physical workplace, it extends to really any place that your employees uh, interact with each other. And it can also extend um, to third parties that interact with your employees. Let's say that 
you work with a vendor and the vendor is making your workers feel uncomfortable with what he or she is saying or doing. Well, if the employer knows about that, the employer should want to know about that. Um, there are things you can do to stop that, to curtail that. And that's something that you should encourage your employees to report. So we'll go into that stuff a little bit later. Last point I want to make on this, and we'll get right into the Me Too piece, is that all the examples I just gave you with regard to harassment, they were all kind of the stereotypical classic examples of a male harassing a female. Well, it doesn't have to be that way. Females are just as capable of harassing males and males are capable of harassing males and females are capable of harassing females. It's not a one way street. It can go any direction. In the example I gave you with Dale and Chelsea with the quid pro quo harassment, you know, it can go the opposite way like that, too. For example, let's say that Chelsea uh, says, you know what, Dale, she goes back to Dale two weeks later and says, you know what, Dale, I was really thinking uh, about that date you asked me out on. Um, you know, I really want to do this project. And if you could help me get on that project, I could see us maybe going out on the date uh, at some point. Well, in that case, she's doing the same thing. She's putting the offer back on him. So the point of this really is to say is the sexual harassment does not just go one direction. It can go any different direction, which is why it's important to know the scope of this when we go into this piece. Uh, and, and with that, um, I want to give it over to Sarah to talk a little bit about the Me Too movement and then also to get into some pieces about what employers can take from the Me Too movement and what really has happened to the law since then. Thanks, Joe. Um, hi, everyone. As Joe mentioned, uh, my name is Sarah Sams, and I'm a second year associate here at Squire in the Labor and Employment Group. Um, I'll be talking about the history of the Me Too movement, both how it started and how we've seen it evolve uh, since 2017. Then I'll talk about two key pieces of legislation uh, that have been implemented as a response to the Me Too movement, and then some state law trends that we've seen since 2017. So to start out, uh, this tweet by Alyssa Milano in October of 2017 really kicked off uh, the global phenomenon that we know today as the Me Too movement. So you may remember Alyssa Milano uh, from her role such as Phoebe in Charmed or Jennifer in Melrose Place. Um, and in October 2017, she shared this tweet that stated, if you've been sexually harassed or assaulted, write Me Too as a reply uh, to this tweet. We can see at the bottom here, this tweet was retweeted um, almost 25,000 times and liked over 50,000 times. So for those of us who aren't as familiar with Twitter, to retweet something is to essentially reshare her words on your social media platform. And to like something is to show support uh, for her words. In addition to all of these shares, um, there were millions of replies, both from celebrities and non-celebrities alike, uh, sharing Me Too and their experiences with either sexual harassment or uh, sexual assault. And so I'm sure many of us can think back to 2017 and around that time period and remember seeing on our own Facebooks or our own Twitters, uh, people sharing hashtag Me Too, and we knew what that meant and the ramifications behind um, those posts on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, this movement really spread across the globe with both celebrities and non-celebrities sharing these experiences. So uh, as we just discussed, this really encouraged people to share their stories. And uh, this included both in people's professional lives and in their personal lives. So I remember seeing posts on Facebook uh, ranging from somebody sharing experiences of their boss harassing them in the workplace uh, to sharing experiences at a Friday night at a bar in a social setting. And so it really spanned across all aspects of our lives and we really saw it grow into a global phenomenon. So at the center of this movement uh, really is Harvey Weinstein. He's probably the first person you think of when we think about Me Too. Uh, for those not familiar, Harvey Weinstein um, was a film producer in Hollywood. Uh, he founded the Weinstein Company with some other producers and other directors, um, including probably the most notable, Quentin Tarantino. And in October of 2017, uh, the New York Times published an anonymous report 
uh, from about a dozen women coming forward and saying that they experienced either sexual harassment, sexual assault, or rape um, at the hands of Harvey Weinstein. So since that day, more than 100 women have come forward and stated that they also experienced this. And in the media, it's commonly referred to as the Weinstein effect. Um, many of these accusers are going to be people that I'm sure lots of people on this call will recognize, including Angelina Jolie, Madonna, um, Ashley Judd, Gwyneth Paltrow, uh, just to name a few. That's obviously not an exhaustive list of all the women, but is indicative of how widespread um, this went across the film industry. So in May of 2018, um, Harvey Weinstein was arrested in New York and he was charged with rape. He was found guilty on two of the felonies and he was sentenced to 23 years in prison where he still is today. And the earliest he will be released is November, 2039. So in about 17 years. So in the years since 2017, um, allegations have been brought across different industries, including uh, media, the legal profession, and um, co like comedic uh, people. And so these allegations include against uh, James Franco, who is a notable actor, uh, Matt Lauer, who a lot of us will recognize from his uh, role as the co-host of the Today Show and an Olympic correspondent, uh, Brad Kavanaugh, for those who are attorneys on the call, I'm sure will remember uh, this from his confirmation hearing to the Supreme Court in 2018. Jamie Foxx, who is also an actor. Um, Morgan Freeman, most known probably for his roles in Shawshank Redemption and Batman Trilogy, but also I'm sure many more that I'm forgetting. And uh, Kevin Spacey, who we probably all recognize from the show House of Cards. And so uh, just with this slide, we want to indicate, you know, how cross industry these allegations came and it wasn't specific to just uh, the media or just the film industry. So as a result of this, uh, the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund was an initiative spearheaded in 2018 by uh, about 300 women working in film. And uh, the initiative focused on providing uh, financial support for people or workers to uh, bring legal action against their accusers. So since 2018, uh, the Times Up Fund has helped connect about 3,700 people uh, to attorneys. So has had um, a significant impact on the amount of claims able to be brought uh, financially. So you might be thinking, how does this affect me as an employer? Uh, so let's bring this back to the workplace. Um, in this survey by Have Her Back Consulting, we can see that uh, when asked, about 57% of women stated that Me Too had the biggest impact um, in culture and society at large. So this can look at social media, maybe the perception of the Me Too movement or the perception of sexual harassment in society. Uh, about 28% of women felt that it had impact on society and them equally, and so them personally, and perhaps most telling for the people on this call, only 15% of respondents stated that Me Too had the biggest impact in their workplace and on their career and opportunities. So uh, you might be asking, uh, what effect does this have on me as an employer in the workplace? Uh, how does this move the needle? What does this look like going forward? So not much, honestly, has changed to the substantive law since the Me Too movement in 2017. We can look at Title VII and see that hostile work environment claims are still um, very similar to where they were pre-Me Too. And in Ohio law, it's very uh, much substantively the law has not changed. What we have seen a change in is employers implementing non-legal requirements um, into their workplace. So this can include implementing anonymous reports for sexual harassment and sexual abuse claims, um, increasing sexual harassment training and policies, and focusing on general changes in their workplace culture and making sure that they're having a good workplace culture surrounding harassment and um, abuse claims.
Oh, Joe, I think you're on mute. You would think I would have learned that by now. Um, but Sarah, I'm gonna jump in here and just and make one little comment or two little comments. Um, one is, yeah, Sarah's exactly right about substance of law. You know, Me Too was such a big, uh, such a big deal. You know, everybody was talking about it. It was everywhere. And you would think that maybe that would translate into some substantive law change, but it really has not. Um, the law, federal law has not really changed. Ohio law has not really changed. Now, one exception to that is, is we do do some work in New York and California, and we're up to speed that they have changed um, substantive laws there since Me Too. Um, since about 2019, New York State and California um, have kind of reduced the standard, made it easier to satisfy the standard for a hostile work environment claim. So when we were talking earlier about what is a hostile work environment. And one of the things I mentioned was, you know, that it has to kind of unreasonably interfere with your ability to do the job. Um, New York, California, they've relaxed that piece of it where really it doesn't have to unreasonably interfere with your ability to do the job. It just has to make you uncomfortable or make the job maybe a little bit harder. So less of a standard, a lot easier for plaintiffs or employees to show a hostile work environment in those states. Now, most people on this call, it probably doesn't matter to at all, but it does show that there has been a little bit of that change. But to Sarah's point too, um, culturally, we've seen some changes at workplaces. And, and, and what that means really is, the biggest thing, and Sarah touched on it too, is anonymous reporting people really value anonymous reporting and and because they feel like they don't have to put their neck out there in in saying something that they see is wrong you know and so a lot of companies have have used a platform um, that there's basically a service uh, you uh, if your company can pay for a service that basically allows employees to call a hotline or they can email this hotline and make a report. And the point of doing that is, is that when they call up that hotline, it's not their voice coming across to someone who works at the company that can recognize it. It's not their name showing up on the caller ID. What happens is they make their report to a third party and then the third party makes the report back to the company so that there's no link back to that specific person. And employees have found that to be a valuable thing and, make, and it makes them feel comfortable, more comfortable, at least uh, in, in a lot of work environments. Now, one thing that's that's come out about this is um, employers who have implemented that have seen that that uh, the complaints that they receive through that anonymous reporting system aren't always sexual harassment based. A lot of times, the complaints that they receive are regarding things that I guess are a violation of ethics in the workplace. They might say like, "Hey, look, I I think that." You know, this is improper or that's improper. And there can be a benefit for that too. Um, if there are issues that are bubbling up or rising in a lower level that you may not be aware of as an employer, hearing about them anonymously through an employee may give you the opportunity to correct them before they get outside the company or before they become, become problems. So this anonymous reporting is something that's come out of Me Too, but it's had benefits in other areas uh, of, of uh, running a company than just the addressing sexual harassment piece. Um, uh, we're going to talk, the next slide is going to talk a little bit about claims for sexual harassment and whether or not Me Too kind of really did what it did, what its impact was. And, um, and also I saw a couple questions up on the, on the boards that I will address right after this. So thank you for asking those and I'll get to those. Um, but this slide really just kind of shows some statistics. We're talking about the impact of Me Too. Um, uh, it shows you know, if you look back to 2010, you're looking about, you know, 8,000 claims that the EEOC, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, received that alleged sexual harassment. Um, this is in the country. So they received about 8,000 in 2010. And you can see that, that number goes down a little bit from 2010 uh, uh, on through, you know, 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014. Um, and then Me Too happens in 2017. And in 2018 and 2019, you kind of see a little uptick. You do see an uptick of maybe about a thousand claims. Um, but the uptick, you know, really in 2018, 7,600 and 2019, 7,500, those are still below kind of where things were in 2010, 2011. So when you look at it in the grand scheme of things, 
you know, did was there a little uptick? Sure, but was it a drastic uptick? Not really. Um, it's kind of stayed in this range for this period of time. So did me to have an impact on that? You know, sure, it had a little uptick, but it doesn't seem to be as big as as one might have expected. Fiscal year 2020, you see down there, and that's hard to judge because a lot of people were working from home then and didn't have the opportunity to get into these weird scenarios that produce sexual harassment claims. However, it is interesting to note that there's still 6,500 claims that were filed, meaning that even with people working remotely, uh, that there are still ways that people figure out how to you know, harass people or at least, uh, uh, or people feel like they're being harassed at least when they file these claims. So that's something interesting to look at. But with that, I wanna address these questions that we've got these boards, because I think we're at a good spot right now to address them. Um, so I wanna first go to the question that came through about vaccine harassment uh, and whether someone I'm imagining, the question is if you got the vaccine or if you didn't get the vaccine, if someone is saying, you know, is giving you a hard time about it. Um, and I think that um, the answer is, I, I do not think that there's anything um, illegal about doing that, um, about vaccine harassment, at least according to the laws that we're talking about here. Title VII doesn't protect that. Ohio law doesn't protect that. But I will say that when the law doesn't protect something, and we talked today that harassment is really, you know, certain types of unwelcome conduct that are related to a protected characteristic. Getting the vaccine or not getting a vaccine is not protected characteristic. However, there are um, there's the term bullying, and I'm sure a lot of people have heard bullying. Now, there's no comprehensive law prohibiting bullying, but as a matter of workplace policy, a lot of workplaces have implemented policies prohibiting bullying. And what bullying is is really just harassment minus the protected characteristic. So it doesn't have to be tied to um, you know being uh, a woman or being this old or whatever, if someone is giving you, uh, someone is treating you in a way that's intimidating or hostile, um, that can still constitute bullying. And even though bullying isn't illegal, a lot of times employers do have policies that prohibit that. So that's something to keep in mind on that piece. Um, other questions. Um, I saw two more come through uh, about harassment and said, does harassment extend to a situation where you leave an office party and go back somewhere else with a coworker, and then things subsequently become uncomfortable? The answer to that's yes. Um, there's really no cutoff point for when two coworkers uh, could be subject to employment laws um, if it meets the criteria that we talked about before. If what's happening has, you know, it's turned into an uncomfortable scenario uh, and one employee is expressing that it's uncomfortable or showing that they do not want this to continue, uh, and the other person is continuing to do that, that could not only be a problem in the criminal law sense, depending on how far it goes, it could certainly be a problem for the workplace because it does impact your ability to do the job and it, it, your job, it could make things uncomfortable for you two to work together in the workplace. And so those are kind of things that could still implicate the law and your company's policy. Um, one other question that came through, and then we'll get back to our program, is how does an employer investigate an anonymous claim? Um, good question. Uh, you know, part of an investigation usually is talking to the person who made the complaint to say, what are you talking about? Who is this, et cetera. Um, complaints that are made by a person who we can identify are easier to investigate because we have the source of that information. And, and I think that whenever we give a training, we say, if you feel comfortable, making the report yourself to the company, do that. Uh, because it makes it, it makes it better for us to be able to go back to that person and to get the information necessary to conduct an investigation, et cetera. But a lot of people don't make complaints if they're not uh, anonymous. And the, and the answer to your question is, how do you investigate that? Well, you take the information that you have, and then you talk to people um, who could have seen that. You talk to people who, the person about whom the allegation is made. You might look at emails, you might look at documents, you might look at video footage that references or happened around the time frame that the complaint is referencing. That's how you do the investigation. Um, so is it necessary to have a person identified who made the complaint? It's not necessary to do an investigation. It is more helpful for sure. But what we're trying to communicate here is that if someone's not comfortable making a complaint, 
and they otherwise wouldn't make a complaint, that they do have a recourse to do that. And I think that that does help employees feel better about where they work. Um, with that, I want to get back on track here. Um, Sarah, do we have our next piece is kind of the, what's really happened on the federal legislation side as a result of Me Too? Yeah, so when we look at the federal legislation um, from 2018 to the present, there are really two pieces of legislation that employers should be aware of that result from the Me Too movement. So first, there are changes to Section 162Q of the Internal Revenue Code, um, which is commonly referred to as the Weinstein tax. And second, uh, this one's a mouthful. I did not name this bill, but if I did, I probably would have made the name shorter. The Ending Forced Arbitration of Sexual Assault and Sexual Harassment of 2021 uh, Amendment to the Federal Arbitration Act. So the changes in the tax code happened in 2018, um, and that affects how we're going to word settlement agreements and tax deduction purposes for expenses related to sexual harassment and sexual assault claims. The amendment to the Federal Arbitration Act just recently went into effect um, on March 3rd. So it's definitely a new piece of legislation uh, that we're going to want to keep an eye on moving forward in drafting and looking at arbitration agreements. So the Weinstein tax, um, here's the language of the bill. It prohibits employers from deducting any expenses related to sexual harassment and abuse claims when there is a non-disclosure term in the settlement agreement. So for those of you who don't already know, uh, this a uh, piece of legislation and amendment really prohibits employers from making tax deductions when there's a non-disclosure agreement present um, in their settlement agreement related to sexual harassment or sexual assault claims. So employers are really left with two options when they are looking at settling these claims. First, they can include the non-disclosure agreement and they are thus prohibited from taking the tax deduction or two, they can take the tax deduction, uh, but there's going to be no non-disclosure agreement in the settlement. Um, Sarah, I have a quick question for you. So I, I imagine a lot of employers kind of have a standard settlement agreement for any type of claim. And in it is a general release that says, you release all claims of all kinds, and that necessarily includes claims for sexual harassment. And let's say that your company is settling a claim for someone who alleges, let's just say, racial harassment, or I'm sorry, racial discrimination, and you're doing a you're doing a settlement agreement, and it contains that general release, and the general release, by virtue of it being broad, contains a release of sexual harassment claims. How does that affect the deductibility, uh, you know, of of that, even when the employee has an alleged sexual harassment, and, and what do you recommend for employers to do? Uh, in a scenario like that, when they have a settlement agreement that has nothing to do with sexual harassment, but have a general release like that? Yeah, Joe, that's a great question. Um, when it's not related to sexual harassment or assaults, uh, we still can deduct that for tax purposes. However, we recommend employers, including a carve out language in the settlement agreement, where the employee affirmatively uh, states that their claim in no way relates to sexual harassment or sexual assault, and they are not bringing that claim. So we would recommend carving out that language in the settlement agreement just to ensure that it's very clear um, per the language of the agreement. So next, uh, the ending forced arbitration of sexual assault and sexual harassment of 2021 amendment. Uh, this is probably the biggest development we've seen uh, in the Me as a result of the Me Too movement, uh, probably in the last couple of years. So this was introduced uh, by Senator Gillibrand and Senator Graham. So it was a bipartisan piece of legislation and it passed the House, passed the Senate and was signed by President Biden on March 3rd of 2022. So this just went into effect um, a couple weeks ago, and um, employers are going to have to be aware of the ramifications of this bill. So first, I'll put up the language of the text. Um, I'm not going to read it word for word to you, but essentially what this amendment provides is that any pre-dispute arbitration or joint action waiver 
is invalid and unenforceable for cases that relate to sexual assault or sexual or har sexual harassment. So we have a couple points to break down uh, to make this a little bit more digestible. So first, this gives employees the option of bringing their claims in court. So even if you currently have an arbitration agreement in place uh, that provides for mandatory arbitration of these claims, that's going to be um, not valid and it's gonna be unenforceable. So employees are gonna be able to bypass arbitration, take their claim to the EEOC, get their right to sue letter and bring their claim in court. So you might be thinking, um, is this an emergency? Do I need to change my arbitration agreements as soon as possible to comply? It's not necessarily an emergency to um, contact your counsel or uh, any clients that you're advising. However, we would recommend that during the next review of your arbitration agreements and employment agreements that you are carving out these sexual harassment and sexual assault claims from your mandatory arbitration clauses. So making sure that you're carving out those exceptions uh, to be compliant with this law. Sarah, just just for folks, why why would an employer want to have a sexual harassment claim be arbitrated as opposed to going to court? Like, what's the benefit of that for employers? Yeah, so one, the, probably the biggest benefit to employers is going to be that arbitration is confidential and the proceedings behind arbitration are confidential. And so now if an employee can bring these claims in court, uh, that's going to be on the docket, which is going to be public knowledge. So um, the confidentiality piece of arbitration is really kind of uh, going away with this requirement. Sarah, just to be clear, on this agreement, this, this new law, does it completely prohibit sexual harassment claims from being subject to arbitration? Uh, or, or in what way does it restrict it? Yeah, Joe, that's a great point. Um, so employees can still agree to arbitrate their claim after uh, the dispute has been brought. However, they will not be mandated to bring their claims uh, through arbitration. And so it's still unclear whether employers are able to offer um, certain incentives for uh, incentivizing employees to choose arbitration um, as this is a new law or a new amendment. Uh, we're probably going to see some challenges in court coming up to really refine and make clear what the parameters of this amendment are. So our second point on this, um, is that individuals or named representatives bringing these claims may choose to proceed via class or collective option, even if they waived this right uh, collectively before the claims arose. So again, going back to the last slide, it's not an emergency. You don't need to immediately update your arbitration agreements. However, during your next review of employment and arbitration agreements, we would recommend, again, making a carve out exception just to make sure you're fully compliant uh, with this amendment. Sarah, um, so uh, in, in terms of doing that review, um, do you think that when when people make these changes, what, what do you envision kind of the, the changes being looking like? You, you think it would be good to include like a provision that would allow them maybe to like sexual harassment claims are, are outside of the mandatory arbitration thing or, or outside of the mandatory arbitration cases, but they could still be subject to arbitration if the employee chose to do that, for example. Would that be a change that might be something that you would make? Yeah, Joe, that could be a great change. Um, just making sure that you're carving out uh, these instances in your arbitration agreements to make it incredibly clear uh, per the language of the agreement that uh, the mandatory arbitration does not mandate um, arbitration for these types of claims. However, you could still uh, put in there that the employee may choose to arbitrate uh, with the employer upon mutual consent. Okay. So our third uh, point with this is that applicability um, and arbit arbitrability of the claim is determined by a court, not the arbitrator. So if the employer wants to uh, compel arbitration, that's going to be decided uh, by a court, not by the arbitrator. And uh, last, this applies to any dispute or claim that arises or accrues on or after the date of enactment. 
uh, the act was effective as of March 3rd. So employers should be aware of those ramifications moving forward. And if they have these claims moving forward, ensure that they are contacting counsel uh, to discuss the effect of this law. Um, so how did I would say that even if someone signed an arbitration agreement in you know, 2018, uh, it's now subject to these new rules, even though it was signed way back then. Is that right? Yes, Joe. So if anything is currently in arbitration, uh, the act will not retroactively kick them out of arbitration. However, any agreement that was signed prior to March 3rd will still be subject to uh, this amendment. So we touched on this earlier. Um, the effect is going to be that your arbitration agreements uh, for any claims after March 3rd is going to be invalid and unenforceable. Uh, I will caveat that point that this is a very new piece of legislation. And so, as I mentioned earlier, we're really going to want to make sure we're staying up to date on any case challenges or challenges in court and ensuring that we're contacting counsel to make sure that um, we're up to date on that. So as Joe touched on earlier, parties are free to arbitrate a claim upon mutual agreements. Um, uh, as we discussed earlier, employee, employers who want to include arbitration clauses should update their agreements upon their next review to ensure that they comply with the acts. And last, as Joe asked about, uh, this act does not apply retroactively to claims currently in arbitration. So I'll just quickly, very quickly touch upon what's going on outside of Ohio um, as a result of me one, too. Can, can we do one thing just before we move on? I want to touch on one thing for folks just because I think it's a unique part of this. Can we go back to the statutory language um, that you had for the for the um, the act? I think it's slide 19. And, and the reason why I want to bring this up to everyone is that this is kind of an area where we want to watch this statute. Um, and, and the, the interpretation of the statute. And here's the language I wanna focus you in on. Do you see where it's green there and it says no pre-dispute arbitration agreement or pre-dispute joint action waiver shall be valid or enforceable? Well, then it says with respect to a case, okay? And the language there that we have italicized to a case is kind of the language that most people are very curious about how courts will interpret. Because as it currently stands, the, what I think of when I first read this was, okay, this applies to sexual harassment claims. But when it says a case, that's conceivable that instead of using the word claim, for instance, instead of saying with respect to a claim, it's saying with respect to a case. And the reason why I think that's significant is that it's arguable, and, it, and I think that it is currently, as it's read, possible that someone could make a FLSA claim, like a wage and hour claim, and then tack on a sexual harassment claim and then say, I get to go to court with this. Now, a lot of employers want to keep wage and hour claims out of the court system. That's something that arbitration agreements are very useful for. They want to keep those out for class action purposes, et cetera. But one thing that is very, it's a very big point, very important for employers to figure out how this is going to play out is, does this apply to the whole case or does it only apply to the claim? And when I say if it only applied to the claim, it would be, let's say someone brings a, a, a allegations for racial, her, uh, racial discrimination, wage and hour violation, and sexual harassment. If it applies to claims, the sexual harassment claim would go to court. But the racial discrimination and wage and hour piece could stay subject to arbitration. But if it applies to the case, as it says in the statute, as a language suggests, that means that even though the racial discrimination piece and the wage and hour piece are subject to arbitration, the fact that the employer also asserts the sexual harassment claim means that all three of those claims go to court. And so that is a very significant piece that does not have an answer yet. It has not been tested, it has not been litigated, but in, in terms of what people are saying about it in terms of what congressional intent seems to be on this, they use the word case and it looks like they meant to use the word case. Um, so this will be a very significant change depending on how courts interpret this. But that's something that remains to be seen and something that may be hopefully by the next time you um, go to have your arbitra arbitration agreements uh, refreshed, 
that that's something that we'll have more clarity on and be able to draft around those issues to make you as protected as you can be. So just wanted to address that piece. Yeah, I want to leave time for Joe to talk about um, Ohio Health Bill 4112. So I'll just quickly um, touch upon what other states are doing just as it's indicative of maybe federal legislation or state legislation coming forward. Um, so some states have limited uh, non-disclosure agreements for employers, so it outright uh, does not allow them to use it. And so we really see this um, as something states tried to do before the federal uh, tax code was revised. Um, 11 states implemented or strengthened anti-harassment training. Um, that could be time or how recurring it has to be or for certain employees. Six states expanded workplace harassment protections to include independent contractors or protections that it wouldn't uh, typically apply to. And seven states have enacted measures to require or encourage employer anti-harassment policies. And so prior to the amendment to the Federal Arbitration Act, we saw some states attempt to do this via state law. So in Maryland, um, in Washington, and in Vermont, uh, we saw states try to limit the use of arbitration uh, prior to this federal act. And so really showing a trend towards the federal law. And again, this just uh, can show you trends or if you have employees in other states, it can be indicative. And so I'll let Joe, I'll turn it over to Joe for the Ohio law update. This is a topic that's very near and dear to my friend, Kevin Shimp's heart. Uh, he helped spearhead the new 4112, um, which has become law uh, in um, as of April 15th, uh, 2021. And what this did was it, it, it kind of made a uniform uh, statute of limitations for Ohio employment discrimination cases, including sexual harassment, um, which is why it um, is included in this presentation. But really, the, the one part I want to note about this, many of you may already know about this, and I won't rehash everything, but that there was a little development on this. There was a question about this May 15th, 2021 date. And I was, uh, and, and here's, here's kind of how it went. Um, there was a question of, let's say that someone lost their job uh, and it occurred before April 15th. Let's say it occurred in, in January of 2021. But let's say the person brought their claim in July of 2021. So the termination occurred before the statute passed and the lawsuit was filed after the statute passed or became law. Which version of the law applies? And there was a case, uh, you know, this past summer that came out that said, you know, that suggested that, you know, if the lawsuit was filed after this date, this statute applies, the new version of the statute applies. Now that case, you know, a lot of employers like that because it cut off the new, the new statute kind of cuts off the statute of limitations, which under the old law was six years uh, for many claims was six years. Um, and the new statute of limitations is two years. So employers like that decision, but that decision was reversed. That decision has since been uh, taken away. And, and then the proper interpretation, the interpretation that's really more in line with Ohio law um, is that the statute is not retroactive. Meaning that if the transaction or occurrence, the termination of that situation took place before April 15th, 2021, that means that the old version of the statute applies um, for any, actions happening after that, um, then the new version applies. And that's kind of a little update on this law that you may be interested in in there. And with that, I, I, I know we're running short on time and I don't wanna take anyone's time uh, beyond where we wanna go. So Sarah, would you mind skipping to the kind of the tips that we have for employers as a result of um, the Me Too movement and the laws that came out of it? And then we'll just wrap up right then. And for those um, that do have to go to a one o'clock appointment, um, we are using the passcode Wyoming today. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, but uh, yeah, we're going we're gonna to wrap up here. But there's just a couple points we want to say, you know, for employers with regard to Me Too. First off is have an up-to-date policy. And that's good because you want to make sure that if employees can bring legal claims for things that are the law, you want to know about them and you want to have a policy that addresses them. 
so that you can have control, more control over those claims. And you also want your employees to know those things so that they can report things when they see them. When employees make reports, it's better for you to know about it than it, for, for it to come to you through the form of a lawsuit or some kind of external allegation. So have an up-to-date policy, train employees on that policy, okay? And, and especially make sure that they know how to report alleged harassment. Um, a lot of times it's going to your supervisor, but the question always arises, what happens if it is about my supervisor? Make sure you have thought that through, make sure you have a good reporting system in place uh, and, and consider using the anonymous reporting if it makes sense uh, for where you are. Um, next, have a procedure about investigating uh, uh, allegations of harassment. It's very important that employees have confidence that their allegations will be taken seriously. And it's also important that employees have confidence that just because someone makes a complaint about them doesn't necessarily mean that they're automatically in trouble. There has to be some level of, you know, really looking into and determining whether this violated policy or law. So have a, have a procedure for investigating those uh, claims. And then lastly, as Sarah was mentioning, make sure that your arbitration agreements if you have them are compliant with the most recent law. There are some pretty significant changes that could come about from this. And once we have a little bit more knowledge about how this interpretation is gonna be of the new law, um, you know, go to your legal counsel, ask for advice about how to make your arbitration agreement uh, as protective as you as possible. And so those are really the, um, the, the pieces of advice we have for you that come out of the Me Too movement. And, and I think we are just at 101 right now. So I wanna say that We've done, we're done with what we have to say. I'm happy to stay on to answer any questions that, that people may have, um, but um, the passcode is Wyoming for those of you seeking um, um, CLE credit. And thank you again for your uh, participation and attention today. And for those seeking CLE credit, I will be sending out these slides shortly as well as a survey and that's where you'll submit the code Wyoming. And Joe, just wanted to maybe circle back on the House Bill 352 changes and the Farringer Eller defense. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe you can talk about why that's important for employers and why trainings like these that you and Sam can provide to employers is an important step that they should be taking. Yeah. Well, the, 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 the defense that you're mentioning is an affirmative defense that exists at federal law. And basically what it says is, is if you have a policy, uh, that prohibits, sorry, prohibits uh, sexual harassment, discrimination, retaliation. Um, and you can show that employees knew about it. And there was a procedure for them to use to address whatever, whatever they're complaining about. And they didn't use it. Or that when you knew about it, that you took, you made an investigation and you took steps to it. It's an affirmative defense that bars their claims. It's basically saying if they didn't follow the procedure, if they didn't use the resources that were available to employees, um, that they can't then make a claim for sexual harassment, discrimination, or retaliation if they didn't utilize what was before them. So a very thanks for pointing that out, Kevin, because a very important piece of this is if you train employees, if you give them the ability to make reports and, and know when to make reports, and they don't use that, that it stops them from going out and making a complaint um, that, that um, you know, could, could subject your company to liability. Great. Do you want to go to your contact information slide? Sure thing. Great. Well, thank you everyone for attending. Joe and Sarah, thank you for sharing your expertise today. Um, and this presentation was very well done and it's very clear that you guys are experts in helping employers navigate these complicated laws um, that really are changing, uh, whether it's state law and federal law or, um, you know, through administrative rulemaking. So it's a always evolving um, area of the law, and it's great that we were able to hear from the both of you. So thank you so much. Thank you, Kevin. Happy to do it. Great. Great. Thanks, everyone. Like I said, these slides will be shared out. The contact info is on them as well as the survey, and that's where you will put in the word Wyoming, where we can confirm your CLE credit. All right, everyone have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.